Let me introduce now for our final speaker of the afternoon, Dr. Robert Yenchek. He'll rep he's here representing the National Kidney Foundation of Utah and Idaho. Uh, he's from the, he's at, <clears throat> in Salt Lake at the University of Utah. We appreciate him being here, and I will turn the time over to him now. Uh, so I'm Robert Genchuk, I'm one of the nephrologists. Uh, I work out of Salt Lake with the University of Utah, and uh, I uh, practice general nephrology, but I also have a uh, focus in uh, stone prevention. So happy to be here. Uh, I was going to go over some uh, uh, of the basics of stone prevention and stone care. Uh, I'm leaving the surgical issues aside because I don't practice that. Um, I will go over the background for stones, uh, my approach to a stone patient in general, um, and also a couple of cases that uh, we can talk about as I, you know, to see how I work through them. Um, so let's first talk about the clinical impact of kidney stones. Uh, the kidney stone uh, prevalence is uh, uh, quite high. Uh, it's also increasing. So the latest data that we have is from 2010, where it was approximately 8% prevalence. Um, uh, and um, this uh, prevalence is uh, comparable to the, uh, or approximately similar to the, the prevalence of type 2 diabetes. And so it, just to give some perspective, it's very common. Uh, it tends to be a, uh, a disease that recurs, uh, not uncommonly, up to uh, 30 or 40 percent, depending on which uh, data you look at. Um, it also generates ER visits and hospitalizations. So uh, this is some uh, basic data about uh, uh, age and, and uh, sex in terms of stone uh, presentation. And uh, these are the areas to focus on. So you can see uh, both in, in men and women, the uh, rates of percentages of who has uh, stones. Um, and it tends to be uh, a, an illness that occurs in the Middle Ages, uh, you know, in terms of 40 to 60 years old approximately, for the most part, and predominantly a male. These are some breakdowns of various stone types, and there's a lot of uh, uh, different types of stones here, but Really, really, the common ones are what I would point out. Uh, so um, the most common being calcium oxalate, which occur about 67% of the time. Um, apatite and brushite are both calcium phosphate um, uh, types. They're the next most common if you group them together. Uric acid is the, the third most common. So we'll, we'll focus on those three uh, in this talk. These are breakdowns based on sex, so male versus female, and, and you can see that calcium oxalate stones tend to be a little bit more common among males, whereas calcium phosphate um, uh, is more common among females, and uric acid is more common among males. Um, these are stone breakdowns by age, and I think the, the key part here that uh, I would take away from this slide is that uric acid stones are, are the one that's fairly uncommon in younger ages, but it occurs more commonly in older individuals. Uh, th those are the, that's the line there with the, the diamonds. Um, increasingly, kidney stone disease is not just a matter of having kidney stones. Uh, we, we think of it as more as a systemic disorder that affects the body. Uh, there are disease correlations that we're discovering. Uh, so, for example, uh, chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease are more common among stone formers. Uh, there's associations with bone disease and fracture risk, as well as potential uh, associations with uh, heart disease, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and so forth. Uh, this is some data from the Mayo Clinic uh, looking at um, about 7,000 stone formers and uh, matched controls. And uh, it just demonstrates that they have a, a much higher cumulative incidence of uh, end-stage renal disease. They, the, the patients who do go on to have end-stage renal disease uh, tend to be patients who have uh, or have had more, more often um, uh, obstructive events. So let's talk about uh, an approach to a stone patient. Uh, so who would need a workup? Um, 
Well, uh, anybody with multiple stones, uh, either uh, all at once or sequentially, um, a patient who has a stone at a young age, uh, family history, unusual stone type. Uh, if there's a solitary kidney, we'd worry about their risk of acute kidney injury with a stone event. Uh, any medical conditions that would predispose them to having stones. Um, and then, of course, anybody who wants one. Um, it, we tend to think of these uh, uh, the, uh, general concepts about how stones form based on the diet, uh, non-dietary factors, and certain urinary uh, uh, factors as well. But I like to have people think about this in terms of what creates the right urinary environment for stone formation both in terms of uh, things that inhibit stone growth and also things that promote stone growth. Um, so we'll go through some of that as we, we go through this approach. Uh, when I talk to patients, I think about stone frequency and how often they have events, either through surgeries or passage of stones, um, and if they had any complications related to their stone history. Um, I go through their medical history looking for associations with illnesses that might predispose them to forming stones, such as obesity, gout, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, any bowel disease or bone disease, uh, bariatric surgery, uh, RTAs, which we see more often, and, and sarcoid as well, uh, are some, some of the ones to think about. Um, there are medications that can predispose to forming stones, such as uh, uh, the carbon carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, such as acetazolamide, uh, topiramate, zonizamide. These medications can predispose to calcium phosphate stone formation. Uh, there's other drug, uh, drugs that are involved, like proteus inhibitors and triamterine, uh, which can form stones themselves, probenicid, uh, and, and many others that, that can occur. Supplements like vitamin C and vitamin D are important to keep track of. Um, calcium supplements themselves uh, and other herbal supplements such as, for example, turmeric, uh, which can have a lot of oxalate. Uh, I also look through their occupational history and environmental history in terms of w whether or not they're able to use a, a bathroom regularly or if they're able to keep up with their fluid intake or if they're prone to dehydration during their work environment, alcohol history, and also their family history of stones as well. Um, these are some uh, uh, causes to look for a genetic disorder that causes stones. So uh, we think about stones in, in terms of uh, um, uh, whether or not somebody has a family history. And it's probably true that there are many uh, people who have some sort of genetic predisposition to stones that's really a, a creating a kind of a polygenic environment that makes them more likely to have stones. But we want to find the patients who have a monogenic uh, cause for stones, so a single gene. And some of the ones to, to I guess, to, to boil this uh, list down a little bit would be early onset, uh, so if you have a young patient with stones, uh, highly active stone disease, um, nephrocalcinosis, if it's associated with renal failure or if there's an unusual stone type. I think these are the ones I would focus on to really dig deeper whether to see if there's a, a genetic cause. Um, I look through their dietary history uh, in terms of fluids, uh, dairy intake, processed foods, meat in the diet, and so forth, uh, uh, and then also the blood pressure and BMI as far as the exam. Um, but otherwise, the exam's pretty limited in a, uh, for stone evaluation. Um, the lab work I get uh, is usually uh, starts with the chemistry, um, also looking at... Uh, um, the calcium and albumin, the phosphorus, uh, PTH, usually uh, for stone for calcium stone formers, uh, and sometimes I measure vitamin D levels, uh, thyroid, magnesium, uric acid. Um, sometimes the ur urinalysis can be helpful uh, for pH, um, also blood and protein if you're looking for signs of CKD, uh, and uh, potentially urine culture if their urine pH is very high. Uh, and then the stone analysis, which is always helpful for uh, confirming a stone type, and it does help in guiding therapy. Um, I also look through their imaging to look at, uh, first of all, their stone burden, um, and also to help monitor for disease activity. Um, I try to get a sense for their risk of recurrence, um, and also looking for 
any sort of anatomical issues uh, that might predispose them to forming stones. Um, and then also I use imaging for monitoring therapy. Once we get them on a, a, a prevention regimen, uh, we want to see them not growing new stones or, or uh, um, uh, bigger stones. Um, and then I, I'll do a 24-hour urine. So the 24-hour urine includes these elements, which I'll go through later on in the talk. Um, most of them are measured. Uh, the supersaturation scores are calculated. And so we use these as a way to guide or to understand uh, a, a person's predisposition to forming stones. Um, a two-collection strategy is generally preferred, uh, and I'll show you some data re related to that in a little bit. Uh, but this is an example slide, and, and, and what I would uh, point out here are really the, the supersaturation scores. So they, they list calcium oxalate, uh, calcium phosphate, and uric acid. So these scores will help to uh, uh, get a sense for where a patient's stone risk is. Um, there are ranges of normals uh, that you'll see on a, on a report like this. And for the most part, uh, they're not very helpful. Uh, for the most part, we think about stone risk in terms of a, a graded risk. So, um, for example, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, uh, there is no formal definition for hypercalciuria or a high urine calcium. Uh, we think about it as a graded risk, so uh, the lower the better. But it does go through, uh, on the top row, you'll see uh, kind of the mineral content of the urine that uh, are the major stone promoters and inhibitors. Uh, and then there's also the dietary factors that uh, in the second row that uh, we'll look at as well. Uh, and then there, at the bottom there, you'll see uh, some reference ranges. And what, what I, I usually look for there is that uh, the 24-hour urine creatinine. And that's a good way to guide or, or get a sense of whether a patient is doing an accurate 24-hour collection. If they can collect the urine repeatedly uh, over a 24-hour period and get a similar number for their urine creatinine, uh, then I know it's, it's fairly um, uh, consistent. Uh, this is some information about these mineral uh, factors and on, on the 24-hour urine report, and these are patients who had two back-to-back 24-hour -back urines, and it just demonstrates the large variability in percentage uh, in terms of the content uh, of the 24-hour urines, and so it's always helpful to have a couple of them to get a sense of um, uh, uh, how, uh, what, what's happening with the patient. Um, just for your knowledge, uh, this is a, um, a, a ROX nomogram. Uh, you can search for this online. It's an online calculator, and it does, if you go through the questions, it does give you a sense for predicting a risk of recurrence uh, for a patient. Um, and so you can kind of go through these questions and add up the score and then get a sense of their two, five, and 10-year recurrence rates. Um, but it's not, um, not been prospectively validated yet, so uh, uh, it, it, it might be a, a helpful tool with more, more time and more data. So uh, let's talk about uh, some case-based treatment strategies for these stone types. Um, I'll start with calcium stones and spend the most time on, on, on calcium stones. Calcium stones, uh, first of all, they're, they're, at least calcium oxalate are, are the most common, but that's also where we have the most uh, data uh, to guide our therapy. Um, so uh, this is a 25-year-old uh, male with a history of uh, uh, kidney stones uh, that are recurrent, and they started a few years prior, and he's passing about one to two stones per month. Uh, his stone type uh, is predominantly calcium oxalate. It's not uncommon. You'll see a little bit of calcium phosphate on a, on a, a stone analysis in a patient like this. And so this is his initial 24-hour uh, urine. Um, and what I would point out here is uh, uh, the notable factors that he does have a low urine citrate. It's in, it's in bold there to help you with that. Uh, but it is low, and citrate is protective of, of stones. So we want that higher. Um, he um, also has a uh, somewhat low urine pH um, and uh, a high uric acid, high sodium, and a high sulfate. And so um, what I would gain from this is that uh, the high sulfates uh, and also the urine, ure, uh, urinary and nitrogen, the PCR is a protein catabolic rate, all of those indicate animal protein intake. Uh, so he's eating a lot of meat in his diet. He has a high salt diet. 
Um, it's not surprising that he has a high uric acid level um, and uh, a little bit more of an acidic urine. And curiously, he has a high supersaturation score for uric acid stones, even though he had a calcium oxalate stone. And so for a patient like this it, it, who's seeing me for the first time, I usually will start with a dietary approach to stone prevention. So what, what do we do for that? Um, for, for my patients, I usually like to target a, a urine output of about two and a half liters uh, per day. And so that means drinking enough uh, to, to reach that target. Um, a low sodium diet, normal calcium, uh, uh, are also good strategies for any calcium stone former. Uh, it's debatable about whether a low oxalate diet would be helpful. Some people, it makes a big difference. In other patients, it, it, uh, it does not. Um, a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables is also helpful, and avoiding fad diets uh, can be helpful as well. Uh, and I usually have patients avoid calcium supplements, uh, except for patients who are truly unable to get enough calcium in their diet. Um, so this is a, based off of a randomized trial uh, from a long time ago now, uh, 2002, uh, where they looked at 120 patients, so it was rather small, um, and uh, these were recurrent uh, calcium oxalate stone formers. And they randomized them to a low calcium diet versus a normal calcium, low sodium, low animal protein diet. Um, and what they found is that the urine oxalate decreased with uh, a normal calcium diet, uh, and they had less stones. So these are, uh, uh, this is the cumulative incidence of stone events uh, in uh, comparing the low calcium versus the normal calcium diets. Um, and so that's the basis for the, the diet that we recommend. Um, there is uh, a lot of uh, observational evidence regarding uh, fluid intake and keeping a dilute urine uh, as being beneficial. This is data from the health professional follow-up study. There's also data from the, uh, the nurse's health study as well that is comparable. And basically what it shows is that it, uh, for patients who drink a higher amount of fluids, that they have a lower stone rate. Um, so in this patient, I, I counseled them on fluid intake, a low sodium diet, um, normal calcium diet, and uh, limiting his animal proteins. And uh, this was his follow-up uh, testing. And it, the column above is the, the most recent date for him. And so you can see his urine volume actually went down. Uh, his urine calcium actually increased. His citrate didn't change, his uric acid didn't change, uh, and he's still eating a lot of protein in his diet, as, as demonstrated by the sulfates. Um, they're pretty consistent samples for the most part uh, in terms of the urine creatinines. Um, so what do we do at this point? So at this point, he's got hypercalciuria, uh, hypocitraturia, and uh, hyperuricosuria. Um, so let me, let me talk a little bit about these factors. Um, Hypercalciuria, again, I mentioned earlier, there's no formal definition for it, though, although you'll hear people say more than 250 or perhaps more than 300. Uh, but truly, uh, uh, patients can form stones even if they're, they're lower, uh, at lower levels than this. We used to classify them into different subtypes of uh, absorptive, resorptive, or renal leak, and we don't do this anymore. Generally, uh, a high salt diet can contribute to uh, calcium in the urine. Um, this effect is somewhat, somewhat mild. Uh, more pronounced, actually, is a high animal protein diet does lead to hypercalciuria. Um, and of course, calcium is also affected by a vitamin D status, PTH, uh, and also dietary calcium, uh, calcium supplements, and so forth. And so for treatment of this, we use diuretics, um, thiazide diuretics specifically. Uh, these are the doses that have been studied in trials. Um, and uh, when I start patients on, on thiazides, I am always sure to get follow-up lab work. Um, I'm monitoring their blood pressures. Many of them do not have hypertension to begin with, and so sometimes they do not tolerate them as well. Um, a low-sodium diet is, uh, is uh, very helpful and actually helps the, the thiazide to work better. Um, and then you know, maintaining a normal calcium diet, uh, as we talked about earlier, is another treatment of this, so avoiding excesses in calcium, calcium supplements, et cetera. And then limiting dietary animal protein is also a helpful strategy. Um, there are no 
strict guidelines for how much protein to, to tell patients to consume. And to be honest, I find this unhelpful because I don't think patients weigh their food very often, or not least, at least not forever. So I think that, that cutting back or, or taking steps away from meat excesses in their diet can be a, a helpful recommendation. Um, Hypositrituria is a low urine citrate. Citrate acts as an inhibitor of stone formation. So it complexes with calcium. It may also inhibit crystal aggregation in the urine. Um, it's regulated by potassium, serum potassium. So hypokalemic patients will get a low urine citrate. Um, also acid-based status as well. If you're acidotic in the blood, uh, you have a metabolic acidosis, for instance, you'll have a low urine citrate. Um, and we see this in, in distal RTAs, uh, hypokalemia, as I mentioned, certain medications like the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, um, ureteral diversions, chronic diarrhea, and also just idiopathically as well. So for treatment, uh, we'll use potassium citrate. Um, and uh, giving it at a reasonable dose, uh, but at a dose that avoids alkalinizing the urine too much. Citrate is an, is an alkali. Um, and typically what we would see is the urine citrate would go up. Hopefully the urine pH doesn't go up too much, uh, and perhaps the urine calcium might come down a little bit. And also, more importantly, the, su the supersaturation scores will come down. I, I usually use potassium citrate as a first line, but there are other strategies as well that are less well studied, like potassium bicarbonate. Uh, sodium bicarbonate might be helpful as an alternative. And then, uh, um, you know, dietary sources of citrate are um, uh, largely unproven. Um, correcting hypokalemia, as I mentioned, is important. Uh, and then I also mentioned there's no trials to uh, describe how to give these medications uh, in, in conjunction with a thiazide diuretic, either sequentially or in combination. So uh, you have to try what works for patients. Uh, and as I mentioned, avoiding a high urine pH. Hyperuricosuria is uh, a risk factor for uh, calcium stones. Um, and we usually use the definition of over 800 in males or 750 in females. Uh, we think about um, uh, causes such as excesses in the diet, uh, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, obesity, uh, chronic diarrhea also can, can lead to this as well. And nobody really knows the exact mechanism or reason why a high uric acid in the urine leads to calcium stones, whether it starts as a anitis for calcium crystal growth or perhaps affects the solub solubility of calcium uh, is, is unknown. Um, but for treatment, we use allopurinol. Now, there is a randomized trial uh, of 60 patients that showed uh, that allopurinol does reduce uh, the rates of calcium stone formation. Uh, these were in patients who have a high uric acid level in the urine and a normal urine calcium, um, which is an unusual uh, uh, situation. Um, in observational data, it does not seem to be the case that if you give a thiazide and correct the urine calcium, then give an allopurinol, that that will still have the same benefit. So uh, we're, we're not totally sure what, what exactly is going on there, but it is a, a real effect. Um, Fabuxostat may be an alternative, uh, <clears throat> and obviously avoiding any dietary excesses uh, uh, can be helpful. I will also mention that... Uh, uh, you know, beyond dietary excesses, I do counsel patients on weight loss as well, which is a, a big factor. Um, and I also mentioned hyperoxaluria. So normal is traditionally around 40 to 45 or lower. Uh, we think about overproduction uh, through acidosis, endogenous production, um, genetic causes. Usually in these cases, the, the oxalates are very high, over 90. Um, there's also... a, a uh, absorption causes uh, such as uh, vitamin C in the diet, um, oxalate-rich foods, um, and then malabsorptive bowel situations such as um, uh, small bowel surgeries or bariatric surgeries, certain types of bariatric surgeries. Um, and the treatment is a, a normal calcium diet, uh, avoiding oxalate excesses in the, in the diet, um, avoiding vitamin C, controlling any sort of underlying disease process. Um, and I, I'm not going to mention the, the genetic treatments uh, here because it's a whole um, other topic. Um, so going back to this case, I, um, 
I had counseled him on dietary, a dietary strategy, and he kind of came in with a, a urine that uh, uh, actually looked a little bit worse. And so I ended up starting him on chlorthalidone and potassium citrate. Um, and this was his follow-up urine on the top row there. And so you'll see he was drinking more fluids. His urine output was now 3.9 liters. Um, he had uh, a reduction in his urine calcium. Uh, his oxalate did go up. Uh, citrate went up because he's on potassium citrate. His urine pH went up because he is now on potassium citrate. Um, he's still uh, eating a lot of meat in his diet, and his uric acid level uh, did, um, did go up. Um, and he still has a lot of sodium in his diet. Uh, so there's still issues to work on in this patient. But the most important thing is that we see that the supersaturation scores, especially for calcium oxalate, which was his stone type, have, uh, have decreased considerably. And so, you know, presumably in a patient like this, even though he still has issues in his urine and so forth, uh, you know, he would be in a better place than he started. Um, this is a case of a, a calcium phosphate stone former. Uh, this is a 56-year-old female with recurrent stones, and she actually had a history of Sjogren's disease, which is associated with a type 1 RTA. Type 1 RTAs, they are predisposed to forming calcium phosphate stones. Um, and this was her initial urine testing here. And so she has a fairly reasonable urine volume of 2.25 liters. Uh, she has a high urine calcium, high urine phosphate. Uh, and her urine pH is high because of the RTA. Um, and so because of that, her supersaturation score for calcium phosphate is high. Uh, and, and in patients like this, I, I do talk about dietary strategies. I think that's always helpful for them to understand as a base, baseline um, therapy strategy. Um, but because she has an underlying disease, I, I also started her on some medications to so the chlorthalidone and also potassium citrate. And also limiting dietary phosphorus excesses uh, uh, is helpful as well. Um, and these were her follow-up urines that she had done here. Uh, and so you can see, I think she had a, um, uh, a urine uh, initially that was um, uh, when she wasn't uh, healthy and it was, so we had to repeat it. Uh, and so on the top row, you know, you can see she has a uh, urine volume that's still a little bit low for what I would want for her, uh, 2.0 liters. Um, we see the urine calcium has decreased dramatically. Uh, the citrate level has uh, uh, still a little bit low, but uh, um, uh, is not, uh, not doing worse. Um, her pH is about the same, and uh, uh, otherwise uh, uh, her phosphorus has decreased as well. And so because of this, we see that her calcium... Or, uh, the calcium phosphate uh, supersaturation score is uh, a lot lower than where she started. Uh, and so she's been doing well on this therapy. Um, lastly, I'll talk about uric acid stones, uh, which uh, you'll see from time to time. Uh, and I, I just have a brief case here uh, because these stones tend to be um, uh, a little bit more straightforward in terms of uh, workup and therapy, um, uh, but also... Um, uh, because there's less, less data uh, uh, supporting or surrounding this, this uh, stone topic. So this was a 39-year-old male uh, who had recurrent uric acid stones. Um, he um, had a uh, comorbidity of hypertension, um, and um, uh, his stone type was predominantly uh, uric acid uh, with a little bit of calcium oxalate. And so this was his initial 24-hour urine test. Um, and I have the abnormal values bolded there. This was a different lab, so I couldn't put it in the same way. But um, I have them bolded, the ones that, were, that stand out to me. So low urine volume. Uh, he does have a high risk for calcium oxalate stones. Uh, his calcium's high. Oxalate is high. Um, his urine pH is very low. Um, uric acid is high. He's got uh, high animal protein markers, high salt diet. So not a very healthy uh, situation. His uric acid uh, supersaturation score is also high as well, at 3.2. So uh, in these stones, uh, they form uh, predominantly where there's uh, a low urine volume, um, so a concentrated urine, and an acidic urine. Um, it's not necessarily required that you have a high urine uric acid level. Um, and, and so the treatment is, is very simple in some respects. Um, drinking enough fluids, maintaining an, an, an adequate uh, uh, urine output, um, and also alkalinizing the urine. 
Uh, and usually to do that, I use potassium citrate, although sodium bicarbonate is a, a reasonable alternative as a second line agent. Low sodium diet can be helpful as well. That will help to reduce uric acid in the urine. Um, and then uh, 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 weight loss and diabetes control is also something I emphasize in these patients. Um, allopurinol is something you can try, although it's not a first line agent and there's no hard evidence supporting its use. It makes sense it would work, but uh, we don't know. Uh, and so this was his follow-up urine test, so he uh, worked on his diet a little bit um, and uh, also started on potassium citrate. And uh, you can see his urine volume increased to 3.25 liters. His uh, uh, urine calcium remains high, his oxalate remains high, but his uric acid decreased. He had uh, a better urine pH, although not quite to target. Um, and uh, his meat... Uh, animal protein intake decreased a little bit, uh, as well as his sodium in his diet. And so overall, he's taken a big step forward in terms of stone prevention. Um, and uh, you can see the, the supersaturation score for uric acid uh, has um, uh, decreased as well and normalized. So um, that's, uh, that's it for uh, uric acid. Uh, I, this is all the slides I have. Any, I, I wanted to ask or if you have any questions or if there's any uh, thoughts about uh, stone prevention. Have you had any experience with it? Yeah, I just wondered how sodium chloride had a, how, how it played a role in stone formation. So, uh, you're talking about dietary Salt. sodium? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I can tell you that we think that it's from a higher salt diet leads to more filtrate and more tubular flow, um, and that drags calcium with it, but nobody knows for sure. There is an association with a higher urine sodium, which we think is a surrogate for dietary sodium intake, and uh, calcium in the urine, uh, but it's not uh, very strong. It, it, does, it is real, though. Uh, so for every 100 milliequivalents of decrease in, in urine sodium, we probably get about 50 milligrams decrease in calcium. I, uh, you know, I, um, I get the urine studies uh, for the most part, and it's partly because I uh, have a stone clinic, and so I want to be thorough and, and, and turn over every stone. But um, I, I will give a good argument for it. I think that the difference would depend on um, uh, whether or not uh, this is a first-time stone former. So in a first-time stone former, a patient who's never had a stone before and they have a calcium oxalate stone, um, it's a single event, uncomplicated, they pass it, um, and there's nothing exciting going on. I, I, I don't always get uh, the urine studies. Um, but I do always counsel them on diet. I, I have a hard line, though, with uh, starting somebody on medications because I want to know what I'm treating. Um, and really, I think from the patient's perspective, they want to, um, uh, they want to know that what I'm doing for them is, is worth it. And what I'm asking them to do is to take a pill or, or a couple pills sometimes every day for the foreseeable future. And so I think that, um, you know, th that, um, that's a lot to ask for somebody, let's say, who just has one stone event and, and may not have another stone. It's possible they may not. If, uh, on the other hand, if there's a patient who has recurrent stone formation, then, then that, that um, burden of, of therapy with medications, uh, chronic medication use, uh, becomes a little bit more balanced, I think. Um, but at the same time, if they have recurrent stones, I, I, I would like to know if there's an underlying cause. 
there are patients who, uh, not, not uncommonly, who simply just do not drink enough fluids. And, and I, I, I also like to find the most parsimonious therapy for stone prevention. And so if it's a matter of them drinking more fluids, I, I think that that's a, the better way to go rather than just automatically starting medications. There are unusual cases where you will find out something odd is going on with the patient by, by doing that workup. So, so when we, can, when we um, counsel someone to avoid calcium, is there a difference between dietary calcium versus supplemental calcium? Uh, well, I, I, don't, I don't usually tell them to avoid calcium unless they're drinking too much milk or, or if they're having excesses. I, okay. I, I do recommend about 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day. Uh, I prefer that through the diet because it's a more natural source for the calcium. Um, there's theories about, um, well, I, I should say there, there's uh, observational data that says that um, calcium supplementation, people on calcium supplements uh, are more likely to have stones. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, why is that? Is that because their total calcium intake per day is too much, uh, diet plus calcium supplements? Or is that because it's a kind of a non-natural source of calcium where their absorption is very quick and they, it leads to a spike in the urine calcium? Um, we don't really know, but I, I, I do tend to encourage a, a more of a dietary natural approach to calcium in the diet. Um, and in the patients who, let's say, are lactose intolerant, um, or if for whatever reason can't get enough calcium in the diet, then I, that's where I'll use calcium pills to supplement what they would have gotten. But I always tell them to take it with food so that the absorption is slowed. Uh, years ago, they talked about a stone belt in the medical textbooks. Is geography still a, play a role in, in correlation? The stone formation? Uh, absolutely. There's uh, uh, some recent studies that were done um, that looked at um, both elevation and uh, ambient temperature that uh, they, they do correlate with uh, uh, stone formation because uh, uh, the thinking is that you lose more fluids through perspiration and respiration, so 